Good morning again. We're in an unprecedented time, not only in the life of our country and the world, but also in the life of the church. Things have changed dramatically over the last six months. So we began to change even how we would begin to focus the work of this annual conference and what we would do, especially the theme. And I'd like to set the stage for you with a text that we've been using from the prophet Isaiah from the 43rd chapter. These are the words that have formed much of what we have chosen to do during this time. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Sometimes we need to be reminded about what really is happening when we read just a small text like this from the prophet Isaiah or any other prophet or any other reading that we may do in the Bible. What's happened is, is a group of people, in fact, if we were to sort of describe them, the upper and the middle income folks have been carted off into exile in Babylon. It's because they were defeated. And so they find themselves among people whom they do not know, who do not share the same kinds of religious practices at all, of people whom they think simply are not really anything akin to them. And they are like strangers in a foreign land. And they long for home. Where do we worship now? They're in exile. And I would imagine they began to think about what is home? What are we doing here? Can you imagine what it's like? In some respects, they have a large liminal space. I'll talk about that more in a few moments. And that is, is they are in a strange foreign land. How will they sing the Lord's song there? How will they even worship in ways that they never thought they could? Do some of those questions sound somewhat familiar? Susan Beaumont, over a number of years, because of what's happening in the church, not just any kind of upheaval, upheaval the things that we know about, but just the clash of the culture in the church in so many ways, said what we are really in, in terms of the church, are liminal moments. This is between the no longer, which is not was, and the not yet. Uh, the tendency is to look back because we can't see what lies ahead or imagine it. And so we begin to think about what this time is like, even in our church. Uh, we think if we can just get back together, that's a valuable piece to do, that everything will be all right. But will it? We're between no longer and not yet. And on a couple of occasions, I've heard it described like this. If we could just get back to normal, and normal is different for each one of us. I can remember at times when people would talk about, can we get back to the good old days? And I'm reminded of something I learned from my father as a little boy. And he said to my brother and me, he said, I remember the good old days. And I remember that our house burned. My father died when I was two. I was raised by my mother and my older brothers and my older sisters. He probably had too many mothers when you think about that. But he knew that they lived in a barn for a couple of years, had a small dairy farm. And he said, every time somebody talks about the good old days, they were not good, but it got awfully old. Sometimes returning, returning to what is really is not as good for a lot of people as we think it should be. We don't know how to define normal. What is normal? There will be no new normal when we are able to sort of move past this time. What we know is what we really don't know much. What I will say is, is that something of which I've been very proud and has been very inspiring for me is to know that the laity and clergy of the North Texas Conference have responded and lived out in some very imaginative, creative, 
and faithful ways about what it means to be the church. And they've been able to worship virtually online. And I have to admit, there are times I wish I could just be with a few more people. But it's not that they've only worshiped virtually online. They have been in mission deeply, passionately, faithfully in the communities in which they are. New ministries, new spaces, even gathering new faces, it has required their imagination. There are times there have been failures, but we would never risk anything if we were not aware that we might fail at something too. But what is happening is the broadening and deepening of the faith in creative ways. And I want to say thank you. A simple word of thank you to all of you for the way in which you've continued to live out what it means to be a follower of Jesus the Christ. We got to think of the church in a, in a way, I've been thinking about it for some time, but uh, in, a, in a group that I'm in studying something else, um, somebody, one of my colleagues, uh, held up before us a book by Jonathan Sachs called Morality. Jonathan Sachs was the chief rabbi in the United Kingdom. And he really began to talk the difference between contract and covenant. And we had to talk about it in this way because somehow we've gotten to the, into the idea that our relationships are contracts with each other. That our work together as a church is a contract with each other. When in reality, is it a covenant? It is a covenant. In the church, we are prone to see our relationships too often time as a contract. I can see it in a number of ways. I'll just sort of be very quick about the some ways I've heard it. If, if you don't get back to worship online, I'm going to another church. Friends, I know, I know it's not what is pleasing, but you're in a covenant and you're all in this together. We're all in this together. Because it's not just about gathering on Sunday. You think about worship is really the rehearsal for what you do in the week. That worship is a rehearsal of life as it is meant to be lived. And this has been the opportunity for the gather virtually, but also even live more boldly and deeply into the communities in which we live. We really want things to be certain in life, don't we? It's really difficult. What we need more than anything is a clarity of our purpose, what it is that God is calling us to do. And knowing that we embark on that journey, that certainty will always elude us. But what happens in the midst of that journey, it will become clear, clear that we will be continuing in what it means to be faithful stewards. So what did we learn? I must tell you that in March when I said to the churches in both the districts of these districts, Metro and North Central, that um, we will cease gathering publicly face to face for a few weeks because of COVID-19. A week later, we said the same things to both the Northwest and East Districts. We began to work at home. We began to do online worship through different platforms. And some of us learned a great deal. We knew that we had guiding principles to guide us. For me, always it was this, do good, do no harm, and stay in love with God. And I would offer to you that no church really closed. It just did it differently. The vibrant faith of many of our laity and many of our clergy were evident. And just seeing your stories and hearing about some of the things that were being done through emails or word of mouth from a district superintendent really made me think that things will be well, all will be well when this time comes to an end. Well, the number of COVID-19 cases were increasing, you were still deepening your ministry in Jesus to Christ. In fact, born out of one of our churches or one of our ministers and one of our, one of our, our lay persons began to gather we test, which is a way to test persons in underserved communities. And three of our United Methodist churches that chose to host them about testing persons for the COVID-19 virus who are unable to get testing anywhere else. And I want to remind you about exile, that there was a group of people who were left back, and nobody thought about them. 
And one of the things that we've learned during this pandemic and this virus is there's a group of people that we knew and has become so clear is underserved. And were even unable to get a simple test to know if they were carrier or asymptomatic. I'm grateful to Dr. Reverend Richie Butler, the pastor of St. Luke, and Dr. Chris Crow, who's a lay member of Highland Park, who engineered and recruited volunteers and raised funds. What did we learn? Their new pants to ministry. We did learn it, or it was made more evident. The questions I ask is what differences are we seeing? What's changed in the Christian community? What's changed in our community? And I have to admit, there is even for me today that I'm sad that we cannot all gather in this sanctuary at St. Andrew. But we're still the church. What we learned is the United Methodist Connection is not built upon agreement about many things. It's except for the essentials. The United Methodist Church is really connected about its mission. Its mission that we have really begun to recover in some alarming, unique ways in the last several months, related to what John Wesley did in the very beginning, where in Bristol he discovered it's not just about saving souls. That was the most important thing. So don't hear me say anything less than that. It is the most important thing. To seeing children on the streets, knowing the fragility of life for so many people. Uh, the leaders in the town came to and said, what can you do? Well, we can teach children to read. We can offer ministry in prisons. We can help people's health care. And those are the things that they did and more. So this connection really is a time in which it has allowed us to focus on our mission in so many unique ways and really explore what it meant to be made more perfect in love in this life. See, growing in perfect love is not how much knowledge we can accumulate, but how much of the love of Christ and the compassion for all of humanity we can get. I, I, I've asked it two or three times around the all different people. I said, I'm, it would be interesting to know how many meals United Methodist Church has served to people during the last six months, or how much food was distributed. I'm reminded of a, of a partnership, and there are several, a partnership between Lovers Lane United Methodist Church and Christ Foundry, who are close to each other, Dr. Stan Copeland, Amy Spar, or the pastor of those two churches, and how it is they were able to secure produce from East Texas, how they were able to feed several people in the Christ, Christ Foundry neighborhood who literally were without a job because of the pandemic and the stay-at-home wars. And they learned that they could feed so many more, many people between them, and what they learned is with that market from East Texas of produce and the generous gifts of so many people and the work of those two congregations and other volunteers, people had something to eat. Looming hunger was a challenge before. It became more apparent during the pandemic and it is something we shall never forget to continue our work. I'm reminded about how many people really needed just a pat on the back, an affirmation. Again, my affirmation, my appreciation for all of you, but the Calvary Church in Paris, they took it a step of ministry encouragement. They were looking at who really needs just affirmation in the Paris community. Is the medical community People worked in the hospitals, school teachers, and so they wrote note, car, note cards, they, uh, they gave gift cards, they found ways to just simply affirm people's being and doing in such a way. How else did it happen? With so many children now being educated online or learning online, especially in the spring, and we know that there were so many people, so many children who probably were simply lost in that transition because of the lack and access to the internet. Their congregations have done some remarkable things, finding ways to run a virtual school. Fortunately, I met this church in Mesquite, has been doing it and is committed to doing that to help those in their neighborhood who have no access, to help those children to, get, to have an education. 
The church in Powderly is looking to do the same thing and how it is they're seeking to make that internet work so that it can be done. These virtual learning centers are a way to be helpful to parents, single parents, two parents are working three jobs, or any number of ways where people have no access or help. I think churches have begun to see some of our, see in our communities, see our communities with a greater vision of what it is God may be calling them to be. And while it was not safe to gather in the person, we've learned of what we could do. We could volunteer at a COVID-19 testing site. We could cook meals. We could distribute food. We could be even more generous. And we could learn to use what skills, what skills for the benefit of people in our communities. You know, it's important to remember that Wesley was teaching children, as I said earlier, the prime the basic was also seeking to provide health care as best as possible to those who didn't have any. But there's something to remember about Wesley and those early Methodists. They were ardent abolitionists in England. And Wesley found the slave trade evil. You know, during this time, we've also discovered the deep fissures which exist in our society. We knew them, but now they are front and center. In a letter I wrote to all of you sometime this spring, I simply said that the sin of racism must be eradicated. You really do not need to read any other than the first chapter of Genesis and the story of God's creation when God simply made man and woman in God's image. That means it doesn't matter the color of a person's skin or his level of income or her inability to find a job that really creates any difference in how we see the person. That is, if we see each one with what I call God's eyes that each and every one of us, and even persons whom we sometimes talked about as they or them, are as loved by God as you are. And if they're loved by God, and then perhaps we start to think of them as our brothers and sisters. Perhaps we begin to see them with God's eyes. And we remind ourselves that racism is a challenge not only for our country and our community, but even for our churches. Even before uh, the incidents of the spring, last summer, I'd been having conversations with uh, a number of people about this and about how we really address racism and systemic racism as a church. Those conversations began last summer. We began to sort of think about how it is we would proceed. We knew that it's not something that we could simply have a simple program and say, now we've done it. It's over. In fact, we've done a number of those things before. Some of them have worked. They've been ongoing, and it's time to retool and rethink. And that began in a public way with clergy at the clergy retreat last year, uh, fall, um, with Fearless Dialogues, which is a very fun way in which to have serious conversations that really speaks to those things that are challenging most of us don't want to talk about. And the things that we don't want to even talk about at Thanksgiving with our families but they're important for us to do. Those conversations continued with a vital conversation with Bishop Gregory Palmer being with us, talking about baptism, using, using the questions of baptism that we asked just a few moments ago about how we eradicate the sin. What do we do to live, live out what it means to be faithful? Again, that was a conversation of clergy around tables, a rich conversation last January Covenant Day. But you know, we are all learning what systemic racism is, how it is that the people of God are really called to address that, how it is that we start to look at things a little differently and begin to hear and understand things that I, as a white man born in the 1950s, we just think that one time we had the Civil Rights Act passed, 
but it goes deeper than that. Actually, the telling thing that happened to me happened, not happened to me, that I, of which I was made aware, was really not about George Floyd, although that was re, a marking point in terms of the deeper understanding, really began with an understanding of what happened to a jogger in New Brunswick, Georgia. Um, a jogger, an African-American man who ran through that particular place in which I have passed through because of being at a council bishops meeting several times on St. Simon's Island. He would run through and he'd always sort of look at the house that was being built. I walked through every house in our neighborhood that's been torn down and has a new one being construct, uh, constructed. I like to see and trying to figure out what is that room going to be? I imagine he had that kind of curiosity, but it's evidently something had happened a couple of times that so two white men in the neighborhood decided they saw a black man who maybe looked like the somebody they've been hearing about. And so they chased him down with guns and shoot him. And he dies. And the police come. And you know what the police do? Well, they know those good old boys. And so they do nothing. Nothing would have happened. Except Ahmed Arbery's cousin was horrified. And he knew a reporter based in Atlanta for the New York Times. The reporter asked his editor, I'm going to go cover this story. You have one day. You cannot spend the night. It's during the height of the pandemic. You cannot spend the night and get the story. And he got the story. And not only did the outside pressure from around the country, and especially in the state of Georgia began to weigh upon them. And now, those two white men were arrested. I want you to think how this really would have happened, perhaps, I don't know, perhaps, if it had been two black men who had killed a white man. I think this is where systemic racism comes in. Those two black men would have gone to jail that day and not over two months later, as the white men did. You can, we can cite a lot of statistics, but the African-American community suffers from the knowledge that somehow it's not right, that they are immediately suspect. Friends, that is called systemic racism. And it's wrong. And we need to speak out about it. And we need to be clear that all of God's children, all of God's children, are made in the image of God. So we've begun the work for the journey toward racial justice. It is work in which you will hear about many times over the course of the next year. There are three things in which we choose to do. Vital conversations first. The vision of vital conversations of which I've been a part and some of our clergy have been a part, especially at Covenant Day, calls us to engage one another in conversations about racism, cultural diversity, and institutional injustice in ways that are candid, respectful, holy, and transformational. What I've learned more than anything for me to do is to simply listen. Listen more than I speak. And uh, in, in, from the musical Hamilton, Hamilton is told by Aaron Burr, you should smile more. You should talk less, smile more, and listen. I think the tendency for those of us who really understand racism is that, yeah, but. And I've discovered that I will never have a conversation for the next several years with yeah, but. Trying to make some kind of justification. Vital conversations are important, and we will have many of them throughout the annual conference, all over the annual conference, in which I hope that you will engage and listen and speak with each other and not to each other. The second thing that we'll be doing is has to do with intercultural competence. 
You know, one of the things is, is that we all sort of move through different cultures, and there are times I'm in, in a culture that I understand somewhat, and there are times I am in a culture that it's really challenging me. How do I, how do I navigate this? There are cultures in which I find myself most comfortable, probably it's because I can, I don't share their language, but I, I know it. There are times in which I don't understand how things happen, but what I do know is it's not just in Dallas, but throughout the whole North Texas Conference, we are becoming a very different looking group of people. I'm not just talking about the church, but in terms of the state of Texas. Hispanic, Anglo, African Americans, people from South Asia, people from East Asia, Southeast Asia, people from Central America, South America, and that's a challenge. And in fact, in terms of cultural competence, I'm very grateful to Reverend Tommy Palmer and the Coppell Church who saw and looked around their community and they realized there are a number of people, a growing population of people who have moved here from India and they're Christians. And so this was a, a, mo a providential moment in which we were able to, uh, to actually uh, appoint and assign a person there, Samish Jacob, to be the associate pastor, a Methodist from India, who will be serving there. It's the way in which we'll begin to make cross-racial appointments. We've done the same thing with two associate ministers who've been appointed to Custer Road United Methodist Church, David Rangel and Daniel Kim. Every neighborhood, every community, or I should say most, are changing in many different ways. But the change is always comes with children of God. The last thing we'll focus on, and I have to tell you, is one that we really do not know how to get to, and we're in, in conversation with people about how it is we address this. The vision of institutional equity calls us to build systems, policies, and processes in the North Texas Conference that level the playing field for all people. We've identified some of those inequities and really are beginning to work and think about how do we address them? What do we do? You know, we work that we will all engage in as a conference because what it is is we need to remember that God wants to introduce us to people whom we do not know or maybe people we have never met before from that particular region of the world wants to introduce them, us to them, so that we may introduce them to the loving God. And frankly, we live in a covenant, not a contract. We live in a covenant with all of God's creation, and that includes people who are different than we are. I want to remind you about something that Martin Luther King Jr. said, in a real sense, all life is interrelated. All are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. And whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. We are connected. It's not just our churches, but with all of God's beloved children. This is a time in which the church, and it's not only about racism, a time in the, new ch in the church's life in which we really will be embarking upon a new future. We're already living into it. Virtual worship has drawn more people to our churches than we can begin to imagine. I learned shortly after the pandemic began that uh, some people were discovering many of our churches. They were meeting people virtually online they'd never seen before, people who lived, lived in the community. And it's like any crisis or anything that happens, somehow people find a way. It's as if we are wired to somehow have a relationship with God. And so one Sunday, a family joined North Haven United Methodist Church virtually. I did ask the question, we didn't do a virtual baptism, did we? To which the answer was no, for which I was most grateful. But a family had begun to worship with, with one of our churches and, and decided, I want to be a part of that. And that's not only happened at North Haven, that's happened at any number of our churches. And we probably could have 
testimonies for, for a period of time of how people have found your church. And it reminds me that no one church can appeal to all people, but all of our churches connected together with the different gifts and grace and the different passions that, that the laity and the clergy have in those churches really provide another place for someone to find the deep well of grace that resides in the United Methodist Church because of our essential teaching about what it means to understand prevenient grace, that even when we do not know it, that's how people get drawn to a church uh, during this pandemic, even when we do not know it, that our God is always present, beckoning us into this grace. It's that God is going to meet you at a corner, and you do not know. We're really good at justifying grace and knowing that uh, it's the way we talk about this moment. I, we need to make sure these people have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but that relationship with Jesus Christ, Wesley was really clear, it's not just a one-time moment, but it's the span of life in which one grows more and more into the, into the very likeness and life of Christ. And so it's like they put on the, the coat of Christ, and they become made more perfect in love. And so finally, what it really means to be Christian in our tradition is, is it's not about us. We all have desires, and I want them as deeply and badly as most of you do, about being in a full sanctuary with people singing. But I may have been as moved by what happened outside the church as anything in my life. And maybe we've seen some other new things. We've actually broken ground in a new church, the Melissa United Methodist Church. I love Tommy Brummett and Stacey Piyukun because I'm telling you, they had that thing so we were all socially distanced. You didn't get out of the car without putting your mask on. And you didn't get any closer than six feet. And Cammie Gaston and Matt Gaston were there, and Ron Henderson was there, Owen Ross was there. And I mean, we were sort of like, we kept our distance. And that was the first time I'd seen any of them since the pandemic had begun. We are still being and doing the church in some of the ways we always have. But we will be a new church. And it's not that we can go back, because it's no longer an either or. It is a both and so what i would say to you today i think there's the challenge that in this liminal space we may have gotten a glimpse of the future i pray to god that we have because remember god does want to introduce you to someone whom you do not know so you may introduce them to the love of our christ i want to thank you again for the way in which you have responded in the last six months. What I thought would be six weeks is now six months. While well, some of our churches opened around the conference, we will now start beginning to speak with the churches in the Metro District about when we will open. But we will do it with the protocols that are outlined. And we'll do it with the grace that is really becoming for who we all are. Do all the good we can do no harm and help people understand that even during this challenging time we have stayed in love with our God in Christ God bless you thank you for who you are and what you do I can't tell you how grateful I am to be in ministry with all of you thank you